Welcome to Research Minutes, presented by the CPRE Knowledge Hub. I'm Michelle Goodwin. On today's episode, we're looking at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's latest effort to improve education for low-income minority students. The initiative, called Intensive Partnerships for Effective Teaching, ran from 2009 through 2016 at a total cost of $575 million. The goal was simple, help schools identify their most effective teachers, improve their teaching workforce, and connect qualified teachers with the students who need them most. The process, however, was monumental. The foundation selected seven pilot sites to run the initiative, including school districts and charter school organizations in California, Tennessee, Florida, and Pennsylvania. The sites had to take a fresh look at just what made a teacher effective and implement a comprehensive new evaluation system to monitor, guide, and improve instruction. The Gates template said that the measure of teaching effectiveness should have within it a measure of the teacher's contribution to students' academic growth, like a value-added test score measure. It should have in it a direct measure of teaching practice based on some kind of systematic classroom observation. And it should have in it some feedback from students or from parents about the quality of their kids' experiences in school. And the districts were free to add other elements as they felt were appropriate for for describing a vision of effective teaching in each context. But the main components and the ones that were common everywhere were a measure of the teacher's contribution to student achievement growth and a, a direct measure of practice based on observation. That's Brian Stetcher, adjunct senior social scientist with the RAND Corporation, who led a team of researchers from RAND and the American Institutes for Research in conducting a six-year evaluation of the Gates Foundation initiative. Their final report, published in June of 2018, examined nearly every aspect of the initiative, from policy changes and district spending to teacher retention and student achievement. The measure was going to inform uh, staffing policies, professional development, compensation and career ladders and access to effective teaching. So there were five or six levers that the sites were asked to put in place that uh, were informed by the vision of teaching effectiveness. So many of them changed their hiring policies so that the hiring process was more efficient and the kinds of things they looked for were the elements of their effective teaching model. They might have changed. One of the ideas behind this is that they would change placement policies so that new teachers and senior teachers as well were assigned to schools and to classrooms in ways that ensured that low-income and minority students got the effective teaching that they needed. And they were perhaps going to use the measures of effectiveness in making decisions about teacher transfer. If there's an opening at school A, which teachers from school B can apply for that opening? And what are the rules that govern intra-district transfer? So those were the sort of staffing levers. And the effectiveness measure was used, uh, but not necessarily to its optimum extent in customizing professional development. They were, the sites put in both uh, policies to give bonuses uh, to effective teachers to try to encourage them to stay in the profession, to boost retention of effective teachers. And they didn't implement fully realized career ladders, but they often implemented some differentiated job positions that were based on teaching effectiveness. Lastly, the hope was that they would find ways to give the low-income and minority students greater access to uh, effective teachers by the way they sort of paired students and teachers. The resources devoted to the initiative were considerable, including $212 million in grants provided by the Gates Foundation. Despite those resources and years of effort by teachers, staff, and administrators, Setcher's team found that the initiative failed to make an impact on student achievement. We found that despite a lot of effort to implement these measures and change policies in multiple areas, with one or two minor exceptions, the achievement of students in the sites was not greater at the end of the initiative than it would have been had they not participated 
at all by comparing these sites with others that didn't participate in the initiative and controlling for shifting demographics, we didn't find a positive result in favor of the intensive partnership sites. And we also didn't find a significant improvement in the low income and minority students access to more effective teachers. Although it's worth noting that even at the outset, low income and minority students had uh, as as good or slightly better access to effective teaching than majority students. That didn't improve as a result of this initiative. Stetcher told us the shortcomings were likely caused by a number of factors, including implementation changes, leadership turnover, and competing demands from federal grant programs. There are a couple of reasons we think it didn't work. One was that things weren't all implemented as imagined. For example, one of the ideas was that the sites would create a differentiated career paths so that the more effective teachers could take on additional roles, have greater responsibility, perhaps get greater pay, and that that would both help to retain them and help to use their skills and expertise to improve the performance of other teachers by assigning them to positions as mentors or as coaches or other kinds of, uh, of teacher Im- improvement roles. And the sites didn't, for the most part, implement anything that was sort of like a, a hierarchical career ladder. That was an idea that um, was not adopted in many places. Another problem was that the sites used their teacher evaluation measures for both formative and summative purposes, and in many ways they were in conflict. So they put together this this composite number, and in order to use it for things like bonuses and salary increments, it had to be pretty rigorous and both reliable and valid, and they had to put a lot of effort into training observers and calibrating observers and certifying that they met the standards and doing lengthy observations multiple times a year to get a stable score on a teacher. So it formalized the process and it made it somewhat intimidating for teachers. On the other hand, they also wanted to use these scores for customized professional development to sort of uh, identify a particular deficiency in one teacher and do something to address that. And that formative sort of use called for a very different or might have been enhanced with a very different style of observation, maybe something short, uh, brief, less formalized, where the feedback was a a note or a post-it or a comment uh, later in the day or in the lunchroom. And trying to use these measures both for significant conse- with significant consequences and then also trying to have them be input into an improvement process didn't seem to work very well. It pushed the sites towards contradictory administrative plans. And then there were lots of problems with changes in state and local context. The same thing this was go- at the same time this was going on, states were under race to the top. Uh, implementing uh, other reforms or adopting uh, teacher evaluation rules that might have been in conflict with the ones the sites adopted. There was a lot of turnover in administrative leadership in some of the sites. That also kind of clouded our ability to draw a clean uh, inference about the effectiveness of the initiative itself. Stetcher's team also found that while sites were able to employ new teacher evaluation systems, they struggled to provide professional development that effectively addressed those evaluations. In the end, for this thing to have had a big impact, it wasn't going to have a big impact primarily by working at the edges of the distribution, getting rid of the few really poor teachers and keeping the really effective ones. To have the impact it it sought, it was going to need to enhance the vast majority of teachers. And the idea of customized professional development makes a lot of sense, but it was extremely hard for the site to do. There was no model for doing that. Most of their PD efforts were, were group-oriented. They tried to link them back to specific things in the teaching rubric, 
but they it wasn't a real clean alignment. They struggled with the notion of how you would get this useful insight about Brian's teaching and then do something specific to help Brian get better. And they didn't have systems in place to sort of give me actionable feedback about what I should do differently. The rubric was big and formal and it had 20 subdomains and I got scores on every one, but they didn't have a lot of to-dos associated with it. And they didn't have a way to kind of model better practice. And this is my personal feeling about one of the major gaps in the, in the plan was that it's hard to change adult behavior. We know this in any context. Doctors to bus drivers to to airline pilots, it's hard to get people to change their habits. And one of the more effective ways is if somebody else comes in and models behavior for you in a setting that's familiar to you. And uh, the initiative didn't really put efforts into modeling an alternative way for Brian to teach this fractions unit when it was clear the way he was doing it wasn't good. And that leads me to the last point that I think is important, which is the rubrics the sites adopted, like the framework for teaching um, that is Charlotte Danielson's and the DC Impact are general in that they, they apply to uh, positive teaching behaviors regardless of content. We think that to get the kinds of gains that the foundation was hoping for, it's probably necessary to deal with teaching in, a, in specific content areas, that there are ways to go about helping kids master elements of mathematics or master elements of literacy that are not just general good teaching across all subjects, but are specific to literacy or numeracy. And the initiative didn't drill down at, to that level of detail, which I think is necessary if you're really going to transform a teaching broadly. Despite its shortcomings, Stetcher says the initiative did provide some lasting benefits to the pilot sites while offering valuable lessons to American educators, researchers, and policymakers. These measures of effectiveness were valued in the sites. Uh, they said this whole process created a common language that teachers, administrators, uh, teacher support personnel, and the board, parents could use to talk about what constituted effective teaching. And that that was a very valuable thing. And even though some of the sites did away with the bonuses or uh, never implemented career ladders or didn't do a, a great job of re reassigning the students to teachers so that it was so that low income kids had more effective teachers. They all felt that the development of the measures themselves and the conversations around what constitutes effective teaching were valuable. And they continue to use them uh, even after the end of the initiative. To learn more about the team study and the results of the Partnerships for Effective Teaching Initiative, visit www.brand.org. Thank you for listening to Research Minutes, our look at breaking research in the realm of education. For more episodes, visit our website at cprehub.org. That's cprehub.org. To offer your thoughts on this episode or to keep up with our latest podcasts, interviews, video series, and more, follow us on Twitter at cprehub. We look forward to you joining the conversation.